I'm here sitting with Hank O'Neill, and he mentioned somebody over lunch uh, who is, I don't know what the sliding scale on one to a hundred of forgottenness is, but he's pretty high in the scale, and that's the trumpeter, band leader, Erskine, and composer Erskine Hawkins, and Hank knew him. Yes, I, I, I knew Erskine. He was a, a wonderful guy. Um, met him because I was in 1986, I had an idea to do a book that ultimately was issued with the title The Ghost of Harlem. Uh, I had had a call from a man named Les Piquel who was at Doubleday. He was the editor on my very first book, which was called The Eddie Condon Scrapbook of Jazz. And Les had been kicked upstairs from St. Martin's to Doubleday, and he called up one day. I mean, things like this actually happened that long ago. He called up and said, Hank, I'm looking for ideas for a good book. Come on, let's have lunch, and maybe you can tell me something you might like to work on. Wow. So I said, you betcha, let's... So... Um, went to lunch and we talked about one thing and I'd been kicking around an idea about doing a project where I would talk to as many of the old time musicians, some of whom were playing, some of whom were not, who had been active in Harlem in the teens and twenties and thirties. And the base, uh, and, and I was gonna put together a dozen questions like, you know, you know, what, what was the first date you played in Harlem? What was the last date you played in Harlem? Where did the music go? Why did it go? And blah, blah, blah. And uh, Les thought that sounded sort of interesting. He said, what are you going to call it? And I said, I'm going to call it the ghost, plural, of Harlem. That is, I mean, people who were, you know, just like ghosts. I mean, they, they were around, but they weren't doing anything much. And Les, I remember Les saying, you know what, I can sell it on the title alone. Just get busy. And he did, and he sold it on the title alone. And that was all the good news. Uh, I had put together a list of all the people. I made a list of about 100 names of people that I wanted to talk to. And I gave him the list, and it had all of their addresses and telephone numbers. And I would say probably at least a half of them, half of the people on the list I had worked with knew uh, or, or, or something. And he got the green light to go ahead and do it. And I started interviewing the people. And one of the first people, I mean, I can tell because um, when the book came out, we put the, the dates of the interviews. And Erskine's was in 1987. May of 1987, which was pretty early in the process. And I don't remember how I tracked him down, but I did. And it turned out that Hawkins was playing at the Concord Hotel up in the mountains with a quintet and had been forever. Um, so I made a phone call, and he was a bit reluctant to, um, to, to talk about it. And um, I don't know what it was I said, but something unreluctant in him. And I went up, I drove up with... Um, Why do you think he was reluctant to start? I don't know. Okay. Uh, it was that he had been off the scene for a long time, and I'll explain to you how he wound up at the Concord, which is really kind of interesting. Um, but I, I bundled up my big camera, big wooden view camera, and a little cassette type tape recorder, and headed up to the Concord. I don't, I don't remember what town it's outside, but some little town up in the mountains where all those resorts used to be. And I remember getting there and pulling up to the front, getting my camera cases and things like that out, and then going in, part leaving the car, going in and telling um, 
the person at the desk that, that I first saw that my name is Hank O'Neill and I'm here to um, interview Mr. Hawkins and, and so forth. And um, the lady says, oh, I, I, we're, we're expecting you. Uh, and she got on the phone and she buzzed somebody. Or, and this gentleman came out and it was the manager of the Concord, the head guy. And he says, oh, you're here to talk about the hawk. That's wonderful. If there's anything I can do for you, you just let me know. Anything for the hawk. And, oh, no, no. and it was perfectly obvious everybody up there really liked the hawk. And um, where do you want to do the, your interview? Where do you want to do this or that? And at one point, uh, they called for, for Erskine to come from, uh, he had a, a, a small place where he lived on the grounds of the, of the complex there. And he came over to the hotel, first time I'd ever met him, he was a lovely gentleman, very gracious, and we found a place where it would be, um, you know, it would be nice to set up with a little tape recorder and stuff. And we, we talked about a lot of things, he answered all my questions, I went over them and so forth. And I remember when it came time to take the pictures, um, he brought me into where the main showroom was. And I remember going in and they had a wall, a, you know, all like a big one like this, full of pictures. And there were photographs that were like maybe three feet high and 18, 20 inches wide of the people who performed there. And I'll never forget that on the first row, I mean, here is Clint Eastwood and Allen Ginsberg and Dizzy Gillespie. Say this one was the Erskine Hawkins one. On one side was Jay Leno, on the other side was Liza Minnelli. So, I mean, they put Erskine in with the big guys. And um, so uh, it was pretty obvious that he was highly regarded and much loved at, at the Concord. And it was one of the questions I had asked him was, Erskine, how, how did you wind up here? I mean, this is unusual. Um, and he says, well, it turns out that back in um, the, uh, I guess, whenever it was he broke up his big band, which would have probably been in the early 60s or late 50s, early 60s, something like that. He was, um, had a, a, a small group, uh, a quintet, sextet, something like that. But the manager of his group was the same one he had had when he was a big band and stuff. And I guess the Savoy was over with and, and stuff. And Erskine was, from what I've been told by other people, had one of the finest dancing bands that there was. It wasn't the hottest band in town, but it was the one that got people out on the floor. And the people who ran the, uh, the Savoy, the most important thing that they could hear was the sound of the feet on the floor. They wanted the dancers out there, not necessarily the, you know, the jitterbugs who were, and the Lindy Hoppers who were throwing people over their heads and stuff like that, but just the customers who were, wanted to come and dance. And, but that era passed and, and Hawk shut down his, his, his big band and, and now had a quintet, sextet, whatever. And his manager had gotten him uh, two weeks or three weeks or something playing in a joint in Syracuse, New York. And about that time, I mean, I lived in Syracuse um, from 1954 to 62. And for the life of me, I can't imagine where he was playing unless it was in a hotel because um, there were no jazz joints. There was one place where a band called the Salt City Six played, uh, and the only other place that you would ever hear jazz was in a concert hall, in a movie theater or something like that. Anyway. Um, the manager who was sending Erskine up to Syracuse said, I want you to do me a favor. And 
Hawkins and says, what's that? He says, I owe somebody something. And he says, I want you to, on your way up, I want you to leave a day early. And on your way up, I want you to stop and play one night at a hotel up in the mountains. And Hawkins says, no, I can't do that. He says, I've done my one-nighters. I'm not doing any more one-nighters. I've done that since 1935 or whatever year it was he started his big band. And he says, I can't. And he says, please, I really owe this guy something. And it's just one night, and then you'll have three weeks in a row with someplace in Syracuse. So reluctantly, he uh, did it. He agreed to do it. He drove up, did the date, went to Syracuse, um, did what he had to do, and came back on the same route that I guess he took up and checked into the Concord and basically never left. Um, he became the music director there and um, had a quintet that he played with and perhaps organized other kind of music for, you know, if it was Jay Leno or whoever was kind of come up and play. And um, just stayed there. He had a house on the grounds of the place where he lived. He also had a, a place in New Jersey where he lived towards the end of his life. And I, I stayed in touch with him because um, we sort of hit it off and the interview was in 87, in May of 87, and in no October, November of 87, I brought him on the SS Norway to play at the Floating Jazz Festival and put together a band that he could front and bring his book because I thought that would be a wonderful kind of a, I mean, we, we had, we tried to have a big band every year, every year but the first year. The first year in 1983, we, we barely had a quartet. But, um, I mean, Woody Herman was still playing. We had Woody's band, and Buddy Rich was still alive, and we had Buddy's band. And, and I just thought it would be fun to have somebody... We almost had Andy Kirk's band, but somebody stole the book. I don't. We still don't. The book has never been found. Anyway, um, but we brought Hawk on in... 87 and he was so popular we brought him back for a week the following year and then starting in um, 1990 um, we were doing another pro project on the on the Norway which was called Big Bands at Sea and he was such it, it was basically a dancing cruise um, Hawk had been so well received by listeners and dancers on, on at the jazz festival. We brought Hawk on as a um, dance band in, I believe, ninety and ninety one, or maybe eighty nine, ninety and ninety two, and then. Um, and and was he he was playing his his book was playing opposite two of the best ghost bands there were the best one being Glenn Miller with Larry O'Brien leading that and the other one was the Dorsey band that Buddy Morrow led um, two I mean these were touring bands I mean the the Glenn Miller band uh, they there could have been five Glenn Miller bands and they would have worked three hundred and sixty five days mm -hmm. a year but um, but Hawk was out there playing with, you know, Ray, Ray Anthony or Ray McKinley or the Woody Herman Band or whoever. And everybody just loved him. So in 90, for, for a series of cruises in 1994, we um, asked Hawk to come on and play on a ship that wasn't the SS Norway. 
uh, it was a ship called the Sovereign of the Seas. And it was a special tribute that we were doing to a guy named Steve Allen, who was a serious jazz fan, a wonderful comedian and a fine piano player and composer. And I wanted to have a band, uh, a big band. So I asked Erskine if he wanted to do it and he said, sure, that's fine. Um, the cruise was in April of 94 and Hawk died very suddenly in November of 93. And we had already put the band together for him and hired his niece, a lady named Asa Harris, um, to be the vocalist. And I just didn't want to cancel the band. And Asa had access to the big band book. So I said, Asa, let's do this. We'll do it as a tribute to the Hawk and you can lead the band. Fine, that sounds great. Um, so it gets to be April of 94, and this is a, a real big significant cruise. Uh, I mean, Jerry Mulligan brought a band on, Clark brought a wonderful, like an octet. I mean, it had Nick Payton and, and uh, Joshua Redman and, and, and people. Louis Belson brought his band on. One great player and so forth after another. Anyway, um, Asa comes on and we've only slotted two nights for the big band to play. And we had to have some rehearsals to run down all the charts. And it became very apparent very quickly that um, she wasn't prepared to rehearse a band <laughs> and run down all those charts, let alone, uh, you know, lead it in, in the same way that, say, Erskine would have. So I thought to myself, now, we've got Clark Terry, who knows how to rehearse a band, and we have got... Um, Louis Belson, who really knows how to rehearse a band. We have Terry Gibbs. Terry was on with a group, and he really knows how. And I says, but who would really like to? So I asked Jerry, Jerry Mulligan, and Jerry put the band together and rehearsed them. And they played beautifully, and um, everybody loved them and danced and had a, had a swell time. And Jerry had a swell time. Uh, he, he, Jerry is a guy who really loved big band arrangements. He was the kind of guy who would say, Hank, look at this. And he would have some stock, you know, a stock arrangement, not by anybody fancy, just a stock arrangement that you buy. Now see, this is pretty good in blah, blah, blah. And uh, so it all worked out. So the last time I worked with Hawk, he, went, he wasn't there. Uh, he should have been, but he wasn't. And, um, but he, he was just a, a terrific guy and he played well. Um, he, he didn't hog anything, but he played sort of like he did when it was, what, what was it? It was called the Bama State Collegians. Something, something like that in the 30s. Yeah. And um, it was, you know, just a, a, a band that grew up in Birmingham, I guess it was. And that big hit he had, Tuxedo Junction, was just a, a, a place where it was a trolley stop at a park uh, and people would take a trolley out to Tuxedo Junction, I guess, and have lemonade or something. Uh, but uh, just a, a wonderful, lovely guy who led a band that was very successful. I mean, he didn't, <coughs> I don't think he sold 80 gazillion records in, in the 50s. I think he made a couple of records that were quintets or something like that. And, but a, a, a very enjoyable professional guy who did the gig and played well and made the people dance. What can I tell you? What else could you, could you want? Plus he was nice and everybody enjoyed having him around. And he could, he was the real deal. He had played there in 
I mean, he, he had him stomping at the Savoy. Thank you, Hank.